Welcome back to the Papa Meat Channel. How you doing? How you doing? Come on in and sit on down. Today, we're talking about hiking. Well, kind of. There's always been some kind of crazy hiking stories, right? The Donner Party being one of them, which resulted in some kind of weird stuff. Or even the guy who, not necessarily hiking, but went out and rode bicycles and, you know, the 127-hour story about getting trapped and having to cut off your arm and drink your piss and all that kind of stuff. So all I'm saying is that hiking is a very peculiar thing. Today, hiking is involved in one of Russia's craziest and most controversial mysteries. Which this time in Russia, it was the Cold War era. Right after World War II, all the way up until the 90s, there was a big period of time where people were talking about secret experiments, super weapons, all kinds of crazy things that Russia was doing, and God damn it, if the world wasn't absolutely horrified of them. Which even this Cold War era is very, it's, it's considered the Russian Area 51. It's perplexed people for over 50 years now, and people think that all kinds of crazy supernatural things have happened, from aliens to cryptid monsters, I mean, anywhere between on the spectrum of conspiracies. The, the Cold War Russia era, it, it falls pretty much right in the middle of that. We're gonna be talking about nine students from a nearby Polytechnic Institute who went missing during a skiing trip. They were found later with missing clothes and unusual damage done to their bodies, even though the campsite looked largely undisturbed. To this day, no one knows what happened, and some people think that we will never find out. And this has become the incident known as the Dyatlov Pass. And I'm going to let you know right now, I'm going to mispronounce a lot of Russian stuff. I can barely speak English, and it's my first language, so if I mispronounce a name, just roll with me. We'll have the names up on the screen, and you can justify it later. The Dyatlov Pass, this incident, no one really knows what happens, right? And I don't think that we'll ever truly know what happens. But I'd like to talk about some of the conspiracy theories today, because this story is extremely interesting. It's full of so many questions and not enough answers to where I think that's where it lets people run wild with their imaginations. I wanted to tell you, so maybe you could come up with with your own answers as well. The year is 1958 in Soviet Russia. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm trying to make it sound like a Disney thing where it's like, it's 1985 and you're in Los Angeles, California. But no, the year is 1958 and you're in Soviet Russia, which I imagine is cold and people are eating potatoes and drinking vodka. Igor Dyatlov, for whom the incident is named after, is studying radio engineering at Ural Polytechnic Institute in Yekaterinburg, Russia. Like I said, stay with me. I, I swear, just the, it's up on the screen. If it gets too out of hand, we'll just say gibberish. One of the leading technical universities in the country, UPI turned out top flight engineers to work in nuclear power and weapons industry, communications, and military engineering. Young Igor, who was 23 at the time, was an inventor, a tinkerer, and an outdoor enthusiast that had an idea. He proposed and planned a 16-day cross-country skiing expedition through the Ural Mountains. This divides Western Russia and Siberia. Siberian wilderness? How many times has someone said that when they're like, don't, don't f with that? Or even you know what it makes you think of, too? Serbian film. Good movie. Which means this mountain range separates Europe from Asia. It's it's a big deal. It's a big, it's a big mountain range, all right? I'm just trying to let you know it's it is the literal line in the sand. This was not the first big wilderness trip that Dyatlov had conducted, and he often used equipments he had invented or improved on during these excursions. But for this trip, the skiers had to ski over 200 miles on a route no Russian had ever taken before, as far as everyone knows. You know, people could have done it, but they might have died or had something similar happen to them that was never documented, but I digress. Dyatlov designed the trip to be as hard as possible so the group could all get certified as Grade 3 Outdoorsmen, which is the highest level of some kind of Boy Scout ranking for Russian people that I don't know. And if you want to put a little blurb here, you can, but basically, it's tough. And you get a big badge, you can feel like a man. Today's video is sponsored by Aura. Now listen up, there's bad people out there that want to sell your information to scammers, spammers, and all the yucky in between alike. And I don't want to scare you, but it's all out there. Your name. Your address, your health records, which is why I've been using Aura. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically gets me off those lists. They send opt-out requests for me to clean up my information online. This means less spam for me and less personal info online for those pesky little hackers. Aura also has antivirus, VPN, and password management features all in one app. All at one affordable price. Aura is on the background at all times protecting my work and my personal info from the rest of the world. I know I value my privacy and you should too. You can go to aura.com slash papameat to start your two week trial or click the link in the description. Stop data brokers from exposing your personal information. Go to my sponsor aura.com slash papameat to get 14 day trial and see how much of yours is being sold today. It's a lot.
It's gonna be a lot. Thank you, Aura, for sponsoring this video, and back to the video. Yatlov recruited his classmates Zina, Kamagolovna, and seven other students who were close friends or acquaintances with Yatlov. They were all experienced winter campers and cross-country skiers. One of them even, Georgi Kanjimovskinsko, was an engineer at Mayak Nuclear Complex in the secret town of Chiachibi 40. <laughs> I gave up way too quickly, that's alright. It was a birthplace of the Soviet nuclear weapons program after the Second World War, and this place at the time was completely hidden and not visible on map. The identities of the 100,000 people living there were erased from the census. This happened for decades. So what's kind of interesting so far is we're getting into a spot where all of these people are very smart engineers. I mean, even Dyatlov, Igor, an inventor, a tinkerer, all of his friends go to this school with nuclear power programs. And it's just, it's building a theme. These people know too much and they're traveling in a certain area. What a delicious setup, isn't it? It's so weird, like, well, we're all just nuclear physicists who work with nuclear-grade weapons and arms. You guys want to go skiing, or what's going on with that? A few days before the group took off, however, the UPI administration added a mystery man to the expedition. Semyon Zolotryov. No one knew why. He was a veteran of the Second World War with a curly mustache and odd tattoos. And at 37, he was also much older than the rest of the people going. The average being in the group around 22 years old. You know, like college people. I'll tell you what, dude, Simon, even in this picture, he looks <laughs> mysterious. If this was a guess who map of who farted, he would definitely be the person where he's just like, uh, was it me? I don't, I could have been me. I don't know. I'll tell you what, though, Yuri, he's got some ears on him. God damn. Igor looks like a frog. With all this out of the way, the trip finally sets forth. The trip officially took off on January 23rd, 1959. And up until the point of the disappearance, the trip was very well documented. The group kept a communal journal, and most of the people going kept individual journals as well. And at least five of the hikers had cameras on them, and most of their pictures depicted a group of young people, beautiful and energetic. And this is definitely something that horror films are made out of. Like, this is the part in the movie where they're just like, everybody's all laughing, and then we're all relatable. Dude, are you gonna ask her out this week? And he's like, shut up, Igor. Maybe I will. Fuck off, Yuri. Maybe I fucking will ask Simon Yagabakov off. Three days in, a man named Yuri Yudin was experiencing severe sciatica and had to abandon the trip and head home. Ironically, the person most likely to die on the trip had become the only person from the group to survive. Which Yuri coincidentally died in 2013 at the age of 75, which is kind of a, I mean, who cares? <laughs> After he was gone, there was nine. Nine people still continuing on their skiing expedition, waiting to have the time of their life so they can use wood and go down slopes of ice skiing. The trip had been easy, but they had yet to ski far distances and camp in the snow. The group was on track to meet their goal, and according to Dyatlov's itinerary, they intended to reach the tiny village of Vizhai around February 12th. Leaving Vizhai, the group officially went off-grid and into the wilderness. Dyatlov promised to send word to the university when they arrived on the 12th, but a telegram from the group never came. Eight days later, on February 20th, a search party was finally released. And on February 25th is when we get our actual incident of what is now known as the Dyatlov Pass. February 25th, an odd scene was found. An abandoned tent was discovered with personal items, food, and equipment inside. Food was laid out as if it was about to be eaten. Ski boots, axes, and equipment were neatly placed on either side of the door of the tent. The crew's cameras, journals, and clothes were stacked and neatly folded and left behind. The tent was found on a remote mountain referred by the Soviets as Height 1079, but the indigenous people of the area called it Kolot Skalk or Dead Mountain. That's crazy. The indigenous people are just like, Up there? You mean they went up on Dead Mountain? Mm, I wouldn't do that. But the biggest question began as everything's left behind. Clothes are neatly folded. So are the journals. I mean, everything looks like this is like an active campsite. But the biggest question arose, where did everybody go? After they dug the tent out of the snow, there was numerous slashes found all over the tent. About 100 feet downhill, footprints were found of eight to nine people walking toward the tree line. Weirdly, almost all the footprints showed that the students walked either barefoot or in stockings through the snow. This is already building to be something mm -hmm. crazy. Now, an active campsite, they're all smart people, but now they're finding footprints that are barefoot or in stockings. They're not even wearing their shoes. What the hell could have been? Why? Like, why? One person to be wearing a single ski boot. The search party followed the prints for six to 700 yards, and then the footprints just vanished. The next morning, searchers found the bodies of Krikovansko and Dronskinsko under a tall cedar tree at the edge of the forest. They were found next to a dead fire and only their underwear. But above in the tree, there were broken branches and on the trunk of the tree, bits of skin and torn cloth were found. 
Later that day, two more bodies were found, Dyatlov and Kalmogorova. They were farther up the slope, facing the direction of the tent with clenched fists. It appeared that they had died walking back towards the tent. And a few days later, a fifth body was found. It was Slobodin. These fucking pictures are gruesome, which we have to blur them now, but we will have them uncensored and up on Patreon. Feel free to sign up there. You'll be able to look at the Diotlov Pass pictures free. Don't look on the website. Go through me. After looking at all of the bodies, we finally got into the autopsies of the bodies. People were able to take them off the mountain and see, and the pictures are pretty gruesome. So I will say, viewer discretion advised if you do go look at them because, you know, they're fucking dead bodies. I don't know what else to tell you. Which the autopsy of the first five bodies revealed bizarre results. All five students appeared to have died from hypothermia, but something didn't feel right. Krivanjinesko had blackened fingers and third degree burns on his shin and foot, and inside his mouth, a chunk of flesh from his hand was found. What? Doroshenko's body had burned hair on one side of their head and a charred sock, and all the bodies were covered in bruises, abrasions, scratches, and cuts. When they found Slobodin's body, he was revealed to be the one walking around in sock and a boot. His autopsy showed he had also a fractured skull. Following these findings, a homicide investigation was underway. This was led by prosecutor Lev Ivanov. During this time, a seamstress looking around noted that the slashes came from inside the tent. This meant that the people inside were escaping from something. But once again, the question arose, from what exactly? Somebody locked them in somehow. They were apparently locked in enough to where they felt like they had to slash their way out. So realistically, I'm thinking that maybe, I don't know, delirious? something crazy where they thought something was trying to get them and they couldn't get out, so they cut through the tent. It's very odd, especially the idea that they all ran away and they were all affected. If it was just one person, you could see like, oh, maybe they, some kind of drug was administered, some kind of like weird psychosis or something, but it's odd. It's odd that they all also went six to 700 feet away from their tent, which was like perfectly well managed. They had been perfectly documenting what they were doing so far, but now it's just like on one random night, there's all these different things that indicate that there was some kind of not only disturbance, but a altercation, a struggle. There was a couple theories early on in the investigation, one of them being the Gulag escapee theory. The area where the bodies were found were close to a few of Stalin's prison camps. An early theory was that an escaped prisoner encountered these students and brutally murdered them. In fact, Ivdel Gulag was extremely close, but the Gulag confirmed that no one escaped and also the fact that everything was left as it was at the campsite ruled this theory out. Which, yeah, it is kind of crazy that they were by one of Stalin's prison camps, but still, it doesn't explain like why everything was still folded. And also a group of nine 20 year olds couldn't overpower one man. Even if someone did get hurt or like, yeah, you got cut up, you would assume that they could handle a person, one escapee. The next theory was that Yuri Yudin did it. Yuri was the only person who knew exactly where the group was heading. And he was also the only person from the group still alive. Many believed his back pain was a ruse. So now the guy who bailed out early, now people are like, what the fuck do you know? And he's like, oh. I left because of my back pain. What the fuck am I supposed to do? But when they brought him out to the campsite, he was deeply disturbed by what he saw. And he noticed something that no one else had. Some of the hikers were wearing clothes that, that weren't their own. That is a fucking bombshell. Not only is Yuri seeing all of his friends dead and mutilated pretty much, but now the also the realization of looking, being able to look past the burns, frostbite, the, all the horrible shit. He's also just like... That's not his shirt. That's like his shirt. Like they're swapped. They swapped clothing somehow. So many super compelling mysteries unfolding. My God. Yuri also had an alibi that he was visiting his parents in his home village after abandoning the trip. This proved to check out and he was cleared of, of all the investigations. Another theory was Mansi's sacred land theory. The Mansi were native people that lived near the area where the bodies were found. It was thought that the hikers might have stumbled upon a sacred land which angered the Mansi and led to their death. In addition, the group had two women with them, which could be viewed as even more of an affront. Because the Mansi don't like women. <laughs> I know that's not very PC, but the Mansi don't seem to care, all right? But the Mansi were very helpful through the investigation. I mean, they were very communicative with the detectives. You know, I, they, there was really no reason that they were trying to hide anything. They seemed like they were just doing nothing but helping. Also, they said that the land was not sacred at all, and it was actually viewed as barren, useless stretch of land. The night of the group was supposedly killed, many Mansi reported seeing a huge fireball shoot across the sky. A huge fireball. What does that mean? It almost makes it seem like a rocket, like a missile or something, like some kind of thing like that. An alien. Or an alien. Are we getting aliens involved now? 
Could be. This was the last photo captured by Yuri Konkrishenshank film roll. It was a different Yuri. There was two Yuris. This was the guy that was actually part of the group, and this is one of the last photos, which is like a blurry kind of image showing something, but it is, it, it does look like a bright light. Don't know what it is exactly. Not the best photo quality. But if I was a betting man, if I had to be legitimate about it, I'd say it's a UFO. Which also leads the question, did they see something that they weren't supposed to? Once again, the question still arised. What happened? I threw a lot at you. So to recap, nine experienced skiers supposedly fled the tent in the middle of the night during a blizzard, mind you. Don't know if I said that. It was during a blizzard. It was also negative 20 degree weather, and most of them were not wearing clothes, just underwear. By the way, the clothes that they were found with were not theirs. They were other people's. They were either bare feet or in socks. Some people had burns, others had fractures. And also, these people were all acutely aware of the consequences of the snow and weather and what would happen if they left their tent during these conditions. These were well-rounded people. They weren't, you know, they had planned for this. This was all planned. There were only nine noticeable footprints in the snow, suggesting they were the only ones around with whatever took place. So far, only five bodies have been found, and four are still missing. In May, the snow finally begins to melt. And a few months later, a Mansi hunter found the remaining missing four bodies in a makeshift snow den, 250 feet away from the cedar tree where two other bodies were originally found. Pieces of tattered clothing were strewn around the area. Another search team uncovered a piece of flesh. The excavation uncovered the four remaining victims all lined together in a rocky stream bed under 10 feet of snow. The damage found suggested they were beaten by a large blunt object. Which now, because they found the other four people, there was a second round of autopsies. Three of the four bodies had catastrophic injuries. The medical examiner said the damage to the bodies were similar to, quote, an impact of an automobile at high speed. And that's fucking crazy coming from somebody from 1959. You know what I mean? Somebody's just like, I could only quit it to one of those large metal beasts driving as fast as it could. <laughs> Brignoli's skull was fractured and smashed so bad that pieces of the bone were driven into his brain. Both Zolotoryov and Dubininia chests were crushed and had multiple broken ribs. And both of those people with, you know, the broken ribs and the crushed skull and all that kind of stuff, they were both missing their eyes. Both of them, no eyes. Dubinia's autopsy also revealed they had a massive hemorrhage in their heart. And Dubinia's tongue also was missing from her body. The odd thing was, though, even though all that is pretty odd, was that none of the bodies had any external penetrating wounds. What the f*** is happening? What is going on? Looking closer, some of the victims were wearing clothes from other bodies. Some items were cut off and others appeared to be just taken. Lab tests also found that several of these clothing items were emitted high levels of radiation. And it is noted that the radiation must have been extremely higher since the bodies were exposed to running water for months before being found. At the funerals of the deceased, which they were open caskets, if you saw the photos, you would probably be like, let's let's close the caskets. We can just remember them from our memories and not have to have this horrible f***ing nightmare. Many people noticed the bodies were withered and orange. This is a mark of radiation poisoning, and they also had third-degree burns all on their bodies. Three months into his investigation on May 28th, the prosecutor, Ivanov, abruptly just shut down the investigation. He was just like, I'm done. We're done. No, no. We're done. Don't ask me questions. I don't know. I don't know. It was probably an accident. Avalanche. 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 Soviet authorities ruled six deaths came from hypothermia and three came from physical trauma. Ivanov also claimed it was not his job to determine exactly what happened, but whether a crime had been committed. He concluded a crime had not been committed and homicide was not a factor in this case. And Ivanov ended his report on this, and I quote, It should be concluded that the cause of the hikers' demise was an overwhelming force, which they were not able to overcome. Was that a pretty good Russian accent? Thank you. This vague summonation maddened the families and Soviets alike, and it continues to mystify the Dyatlov researchers to this day. And after the investigation closed, all the files, photographs, and journals from the investigation were classified, and the area around the Dead Mountain became off-limits to skiers for years. The exact area in the mountains where the young skiers were headed for, but never reached, was named Dyatlov Pass. Kind of crazy. So now we have a thing about these bodies with so many mysterious things happening. Granted, this was 1959. It's been a long time ago. Who knows what exactly happened? It's been shrouded in mystery for years. And these are just some of the theories that we have found online. A weapons test theory. The skiers died because they had stumbled into an area where secret weapons were being tested and were killed to leave no witnesses. This is what many of the families and skiers believe. And the radiation on the clothes and the time period really makes this theory strong in people's minds because they think that maybe because of the time, 
people came across something that they shouldn't have, you know, and the government itself killed the skiers. And that's also why Ivanov also, or the, the investigator also just had to abruptly shut down the case so quick because who knows, maybe some kind of guys came in, they're like, you better shut off case, you hear? Okay, sorry, I will. I doubt it was that casual, but you know. Then there was the American spy theory. Others thought that skiing group was killed by mercenaries, probably American spies. That seems a bit James Bondish, and I think that was probably just inspired by the James Bond era films. I don't know how much about that one. And then we go back to Yuri Yudin's theory, which continuously said that the death of the classmates was not natural. Yuri was like, this is not a natural thing. And in 2013, before he died, he declared that everyone had been taken from the tent, held at gunpoint, and murdered. He believed that Dubanya had her tongue cut out by the killers for being outspoken and probably because she was a woman that's just history that's not me saying that women have gotten a bad rap in history i'm a male feminist the problem with these theories is that the snow does not lie. It would have been impossible to erase the signs of people and their equipment in the snow. Also, as much information has been declassified over the years, there has not been any evidence to suggest that there was a secret weapons base or an errant missile exploding in the area. Then we have the mystery man KGB theory. Zola Turayov. The theory is that he was KGB and that connection inevitably got the group killed. There's a book published in Russia that claims that Zola Turayov had two other skiers with KGB agents on a special assignment to meet the group of a CIA operatives to furnish them with fake information. Samples of clothing contaminated with radioactive isotopes were to be offered as bait. The thought is that the CIA agents discovered the deception and killed the group and then staged the scene. So now we have people being like CIA agents trying to find nuclear testing stuff. They figure out they're being cheated, so then they kill people and redress them. And then there's an avalanche theory. An avalanche struck the tent, causing injuries and forcing the group to cut their way out and head into the forest for shelter. The slope was determined too low to generate an avalanche, though with high enough wind that could have changed things, but there was no avalanche debris found. Also, the damage done to the three bodies were so debilitating that there was no way that they could have gotten to the stream bed if they sustained them in the tent. And there were no signs of the bodies being dragged. And then my personal favorite theory, which is the Yeti theory. The most entertaining theory and quite popular is that the group was attacked by a Yeti. A major contributing factor to the theory is because of the final photograph found in the Theobald Brigannol's camera, which reveals a dark figure advancing through the snowy forest. Apparently the group was joking about Yetis a few hours before they had died. There was also a satirical article about Yetis seen in the area on the Ural mountains found at the campsite which that is a very mysterious photo but it could have also been it was a joke if they saw the parodies of it it could have been people that they were staging it and he took a photo of it who knows tigers brown bears a more realistic version of the yeti theory the state some of the bodies were left in especially the ones with crushed chest and those missing their eyes and tongue led some to believe animals got into the campers if a bear wandered into the campsite it could be a reason why everyone fled in the snow without their clothes on Seems a little more realistic, but then again, I feel like you wouldn't see the bear tracks. There's just no other tracks. That's why I'm like, are you sure? The bad vibrations theory. Writer and filmmaker Donnie Ekar suggests that a high winds passing over the mountains created infrasound and that this induced such terror that the skiers fled the tent and then paranoia took hold and the cold escalated events leading to their odd deaths. If they ran out from fear, why weren't they wearing any clothes though? Paradoxal undressing occurs during fatal hypothermia, where the person suffering from it feels the body become way too hot, on fire even, and they start to take off their clothes because in their mind they're burning alive, but really their body is freezing to death. But all of them though? That's what I'm saying. Is all of them had that happen simultaneously at the same time? I don't know. The heat theory. Carbon monoxide poisoning from the heater they used. This could cause the group to not be thinking clearly and make bad choices. Though, it doesn't really explain anything else that happened. You know, the bludgeoning, all that other stuff, right? Or the Mansi mushroom theory, which the Mansi's sometimes hung hallucinogenic mushrooms off trees to dry. There's a theory that the skiers ate the mushrooms without realizing and succumbed to sudden madness, which let me tell you, if you've ever seen the movie Climax, that's a movie about a theater group. Someone spikes the punch at a theater group with LSD or something, and it causes absolute chaos, and it turns into this very violent thing. You never know. Could be some weird hallucinogenic shit. I mean, especially if they did it all as a group. Maybe they made some kind of tea out of it. Who knows? Could be very deal. And then they sit there and they gouge their own eyes out or something like that. But I feel like you would see that in their hands or something. 30 years later, Prosecutor Ivanov, now retired, published an article claiming that when he was compiling his investigative reports in 1959, he had been pressured to not include his views on what he thought had happened. And you already know where we're going with this. The title of his article? 
The Enigma of the Fireballs. That's a sick article name, holy sh His article goes on to claim that skiers have been killed by heat rays or fireballs caused by UFOs, baby aliens! He recalls finding it suspicious that he and his colleagues were even asked to test the victim's items for radiation. And later, when he wrote a letter asking his superiors why radiation was relevant, and he was told that the deaths were <gasps> accidental. By this time, the official files had been released and it had become one of the most celebrated mysteries of the Soviet era. And it has spawned tons of theories to what actually happened. And the Russian Prosecutor's General's Office, official count for theories is 75. 75 official theories. That's a lot. The constant continuous theme of this video is what really happened. There are multiple theories with motives and some with evidence, but many of them seem to run into partial issues. What about multiple theories converging and occurring together? Or maybe some unknown supernatural force got to them. But I have to ask, what do you think happened to them out there? The official answer that no one's happy with is in 2019, Russia opened the case back up and they officially marked it as an avalanche, which could explain cutting open their tent to try to crawl out because the other parts may be sealed up, but it doesn't explain the fractures to my opinion. It doesn't explain why the eyeballs are gone, why the tongue's missing, why they're all in different directions and why some of them were up in a tree, there's skin up in trees and they're all switching clothes. Could it be that they just threw on whatever was closest around them to try to stay warm, or was something more at play? If my imagination could run wild, I'd like to think that it was a supernatural force somehow. I don't know how. It's it's the funnest option. And it also makes me feel like, I don't know, at peace with them a little bit? Like if something did supernatural happen to them, it's something that they totally could not have controlled and it wasn't man-made, it was just like this in inexplicable force, which is the same with an avalanche or whatever else, but these deaths just look so harrowing. And honestly, the Dyatlov Pass is one of the <laughs> craziest mysteries I've ever heard, so I hope something more goes into it. I'm sure that this avalanche answer from 2019 is not satisfactory to a lot of people. So I'm curious to see what happens. Without further ado, that was the Dyatlov Pass. I hope you all have your mystery hats on and you go try to find answers yourself. And please report back to them in this comment section because it helps. Also smashing that like button and ringing the bell lets us know too. I don't even know if that's still a thing, if people still even do that, but it doesn't matter. Thank you all so much for watching today. I appreciate you. Have a good rest of your day. And for the love of God, if you go skiing, don't go to Russia. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.